You all are here and I finally got here. Oh, it's good to see you. How are you doing this evening? Good. All right. Well, I still don't have everything up that we need up. Well, I messed this up here. We're not gonna be able to get much bigger than this, are we? Okay. Okay, we might as well get started. Uh, Athens on the screen. But I don't want this up. And I need this up. Am I still there or not? Yes. Okay. And Kevin's been able to join us tonight. Don't let me forget to mark that. Kevin and Kimberly and Okay, let me share this. Uh, when Hudson, not Hudson, Hudson develops this uh, topic of Jewish thought, uh, you have a, an interesting circular uh, issue as to how these uh, ideas um, constantly um, blend into each other, reinforce each other. Um, the Jewish understanding clearly arises out of this little section he calls a chosen people, their experience 
in history um, as uh, considered, um, reflected, refracted, revealed um, through ultimately the writings that they left. Um, beginning with people like Moses, uh, later prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah, what the uh, Hebrews in their Bible collection call uh, the prophets of Samuel, Kings, uh, Joshua, and Judges uh, that are anonymous to us, who uh, develop this uh, historical narrative. Uh, and it's out of this experience, as understood by these writers, um, that the ideas of Judaism arise. And because it's their historical experience, uh, you could legitimately start with what he has as that little category of chosen people, the uh, scandal of particularity, which in fact is true of all of life. Uh, this unique, um, from a historical secular standpoint, inexplicable history, uh, and its consequent influence in the world. Um, Hudson develops that at the very beginning of the chapter. Uh, this small group of people uh, on the edge of the Mediterranean, uh, never a significant size, never a significant political force, uh, not producing any kind of um, technological product that changed anything. Um, how in the world do we explain that he uses the figure a third of the people in the world uh, are heavily influenced by the ideas of this group of people? Uh, and there, there's there's very little in their experience, you see, that uh, promotes them under the values of most of the world's history to have any importance. Uh, they perceive, they explain their existence, these writers, as based on the... Uh, intervention of providence on the, the relationship of a God who uh, calls them to himself, invites them to have a relationship with him, provides them with a covenant, with uh, a variety of uh, principles and stipulations, uh, which they hardly ever live up to. Uh, and so what little political identity they have gets destroyed. Uh, the northern collection of tribes that break away from the descendant of David, Solomon's uh, son, uh, disappear in the mid eighth century for all practical purposes. Um, the small remnant that remains in the south is significantly exiled to Babylon in the sixth century. Um, a small group of them get to return uh, 70 years or so later. But uh, th there's, there's no quote success here for any length of time, for any significant measure of development. Uh, so while there are exhilarating stories throughout this narrative, 
there are, there are terribly exasperating circumstances, experiences. Uh, their best people prove to have uh, clay feet. Um, how, how do you explain this? And uh, Smith uh, cast this, uh, what's become central to them, and that's their meaning of God. We talked about a little bit about that last week. Um, the fact that they perceive their deity as singular, uh, as single, alone, um, as both one with uh, countercultural for its day, um, moral persuasions and values, uh, and despite the fact that those are significantly foreign, even to this people he calls to himself, um, he clearly seems to be very engaged in their experience. And in their work, they indicate that they understood, at least some of them, that this engagement with them was simply a means to something else, that there was an intention to enlarge this engagement um, to include all of the world, which they perceive as a creation of this God. And that changes significantly their view of the natural world, different from the ancients. Um, the, the natural world in the ancient understanding um, were all gods. It was deity. Even when the Greeks demythologized that to, to a great extent, they still understood the world, the universe that they could see in the stars, as uh, divine, uh, uh, as idealistic perfection. And so they uh, understood the world, they described the universe uh, not as it ultimately was observed to be, but as uh, perfection, uh, just as an example. In their view, uh, the globes, the stars would all be perfect in geometric figures. The uh, uh, orbits that they knew existed because of the motion of the stars in, in the which of course in many cases were planets uh, that they could observe, they, they understood those to be perfect circles. And so everything was invested with a certain distance from humanity uh, and material took on a whole variety of things. In many of the ancient mythologies, it was all deified. And, and therefore, you really had to be careful. You know, they learned how to mine copper and gold and silver and eventually iron. Uh, but there was still frequently a spiritualism uh, to the natural world. Uh, on the other hand, there grew among them the ideas that material was not the best thing. In fact, it could be bad. Uh, um, even the Greeks develop an idea that materials have a certain negative quality to them so that, for instance, with human beings, our material bodies are really uh, a bad thing. 
they complicate our lives. Um, they get sick, they get hurt, um, they die. Uh, because the Hebrews saw the world as the creation of God, it took on an entirely different character. The Genesis story, God, after he creates the various elements, notes that they are good. And with human beings, they are very good. Uh, this puts God in a different position with the material. Uh, he's in control of it. Uh, and in their story, they see mankind as the creature of the creator in charge of his creation. So there is a totally different understanding of the world. And there are a number of philosophers of science who believe that Western development of scientific thinking and process is directly dependent upon this view of nature. Uh, that it's made by a created God and therefore it should be understandable because God is understandable. He's made himself understandable to us in many ways, although there are limits to that. And we can investigate the world because it isn't divine. We can investigate the world because it's real. Um, certain views like the Far Eastern view, uh, for many of them, um, this world is just a perception. It's an illusion, even. Uh, and thus, our lives in the world take on certain obligation, certain responsibility, because we're in charge, but it's not really ours. It's the creator's. Um, how we treat it is important. But not only did God create this world, he created this special group of people. And here the Jews run into one of those conundrums. On the one hand, as we mentioned, uh, the Psalm 8 can celebrate us as little lower than God. But on the other hand, um, we really messed up. We continually mess up. Even our best people mess up. Uh, because apparently, we make choices. We're, we're able to make choices. We're free to make choices. In the very beginning story, God gives us a choice. He says, here's something that you really shouldn't eat of because it'll kill you. Uh, depending on how you interpret the grammar as to how much of a command that is and how much of a statement it is. Uh, so choice is clearly there in spite of the fact that we make really bad choices. It appears that we're being asked to make better choices and we're given information about what some good choices would be. So that history, not just ours, but all of history, but particularly ours as, as these people of God, uh, is an arena of this interaction between us and our creator. And because he's the creator of this world, he actually can engage in this world. And because we're creatures in his image, he can engage with us and intervene with us, influence us, use us. Uh, 
So when Pharaoh decides that he's not going to let Israel go, the interpreters can see this as the intervention of God. I'm not going to let him let you go so I can really demonstrate my ability to let you go. Uh, so instead of doing one magic thing, one miracle thing, I'm going to do 10. Uh, and, and thus, history becomes an important element. It's not just the ongoing of events. It's not just the seasons. It's not just the natural world carrying on its things and we're in it. There are decisions for us to make about how things happen in this world. And those decisions, while necessarily individual, take on far greater implications when they're collective. And so it becomes important, not just that Moses is willing to follow God. A whole bunch of people are willing to follow him too. That not just Moses agrees to this covenant, but that all the people agree to this covenant. And when the collective can be more attuned to the creator, uh, good things can happen. And since history is the interplay of this creator and his creatures, then history takes on all kinds of moral implications. And so he moves to this idea that they found meaning in morality. That because they viewed history as the purposive activity of God, working with this people that he's called to himself. What is, is not the most important thing. What, it, what is the most important thing is what the creator intended for there to be what he planned for there to be, what he created to do. And so in opposition to other views that are at the least um, almost fatalistic in terms of, well, what's gonna be is what is. The, the Israelites developed the idea that it could be better. It ought to be better. The creator intended it to be better. And history is the arena in which we're supposed to do that. And this morality covers everybody. Um, remember how he, um, how Smith um, promotes their morality as the barrier against four negative, four forces, four realities of human experience that we have demonstrated from time immemorial um, there have to be there has to be limitations. The powerful can't do everything they want to do. 
the wealthy can't do any everything they want to do. The eloquent can't get their way all the time. Or the deceptive can't get their way all the time. And then at the core of human uh, humanity is family. And so there has to be some significant value placed on the limitation of force, the limitation of wealth, the control of sex, and the control of speech. Which you should recognize as four areas of the Ten Commandments. Um, and his statement that the Ten Commandments constitute the moral foundation of most of the Western world, universal standards that make collective life possible. Uh, on another place, he talks about, you can't do much better than these. Uh, now, let me point out that while the Western world has generally viewed these commandments, especially five through 10, as universal moral standards, they're not presented that way in the Bible. In the Bible, they're presented as the moral values of the creator, more importantly, in the story of the God who brought them out of Egypt, who wants to have a permanent, close relationship with them, which can't be sustained if they don't share these values. And in the biblical view, It's, it's not first God who withdraws from the relationship when these values are violated. It's we humans who withdraw from God when we violate these values. It's we who go hide in the bushes. Even when he comes to find us. Uh, does anybody remember what the fifth commandment is? You want to look right quick in Exodus 20 if you have your Bible. Uh, what's the fifth commandment? What's the one that follows the Sabbath? That's the fourth one. Fourth one is keep the Sabbath. What's the one that follows that? Yeah, on your parents. Notice that even precedes the seventh command about the fidelity of the couple. And, and he doesn't mention it. Yeah, Smith doesn't mention it. He dwells on the commands about force, 
about wealth, about sex, and about speech. But he doesn't mention this one. What part does it play in the stability of a social order? Because you see, it's the essential bond that carries on the order. How do you get from the Ten Commandments at Sinai to the people who enter the land, who are the children of those people? And remember in Deuteronomy, how they go from the Ten Commandments to this teaching of the children, which of course is not effective if the children aren't receptive to it. Uh, there's a, a, a old Jewish uh, tale about God giving the Ten Commandments before he go, gave them to Moses. Uh, and the tale is that he goes to this group of people and he offers them the Ten Commandments and they say, well, what are they? And they, God starts down through the list and they, they get, he gets to one and they, oh, no, we, we, we couldn't do that. We, we're just too involved with uh, this, that, or the other. And so the, the Jews, this is a Jewish story, they go through the, all the peoples, the Amorites, the Moabites, and the people in the ancient world that were there when the Israelites go there. And, and they have all these people turning down the Ten Commandments because they're not willing to even think about abiding by one of these rules. Uh, this becomes, in, in, a, in, a, in a very emphatic way, the, the secondary element of Judaism. The first one being this uh, acceptance of the covenant of God and a loyalty to that covenant, that the prayer of Judaism from, Isaac, from Deuteronomy 6, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. And the emphasis there becomes in monotheism, the Lord your God is one. But in initial Judaism, in biblical Judaism, the emphasis is upon the Lord your God. This commitment to him leads you to these values of him that are supreme. Two of which gain uh, an, uh, 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 almost a monster uh, importance in Judaism. And Smith develops that under this meaning of justice, where real fairness, equity, justice, and interestingly enough, in the Old Testament language, the word that gets used for this a lot of the time is simply the word judgment. Uh, in, in, it gets translated now into English often as justice, but the word was judgment. There are a few places where the word is used in what I think is probably one of those figures of speech 
where it's judgment and righteousness, which I think really ought to be translated as righteous judgment. But often the word appears, judgment appears by itself. And it's clear in the passage that God isn't talking about, you, you just need to make up your mind about this. It's you need to make up your mind the right way about this issue. Uh, there, there is a, uh, an overwhelming reality in, in, in Old Testament morality that the isness of the world then and now, which is rife with injustice and corruption, is simply not acceptable. And the clearest place you see that is in the great passage in Leviticus 19, where God says, you should be holy because I'm holy. And then he goes into detail. And the first couple of items are religious things like keeping the Sabbath. But the rest of the chapter all talks about these interpersonal relationships that you don't try to trip up the blind. You don't uh, take the uh, garment of a man who gave it to you as collateral for the loan. You have to give it back to him at night so he can have something to cover up with. Uh, this is seen as uh, an overwhelmingly important value. And so as um, Smith points out in this section of the book, Israel is constantly caught in a tension between justice and mercy because they're often the same thing. Uh, in, in, in numerous cases, there is no justice if there isn't mercy. And, and so you have to weigh this issue. And the centrality of this in Judaism is the result, it has the result that Jewish community, not only in this country, but in other countries, is often at the forefront of all the efforts for some kind of, quote, social justice. Uh, the civil rights movement in this country was heavily influenced by the presence, the participation, the financial support of the Jewish community because they see justice, righteousness as supreme importance. Now, part of that arises out of the fact that when the Pharisees reformed Judaism after the destruction of, of the temple, they take on righteousness in a positive, almost benevolent sense as the means by which humans, Jews, can atone for their failures. And so righteous deeds, righteous acts become a contravailing force for your unrighteous acts. Um, and in that concept of righteousness, you see, there is both justice where there is injustice 
and there is mercy for the victim of the injustice. Now, what's fascinating is that this justice, this righteousness, is so central and so powerful that the Jews themselves cannot escape it. And so especially in the literary prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Amos, and Hosea, and uh, some others, you get the, the understanding, the revelation, they hear it as the word of God, that Israel has failed both parts of its covenant with God. It's failed in its loyalty to him. Uh, it's chased after other gods. It's failed in its commitment to others. And idolatry, which is code word not just for using images, but for other gods, and injustice become the two central cries of the prophets. Um, just for your uh, contrast to us moderns, um, guess how the prophets, the written prophets, deal with Sodom and Gomorrah? Isaiah and Ezekiel both make specific references to those ancient worlds that God destroyed in their story. Um, they apply their character to Israel. I, Isaiah calls them, you sodomites. And he's talking about their injustice, their mistreatment of the poor, their bribery, their judicial corruption. Uh, Hosea opens his book with a series of judgments against all the surrounding nations, how terrible they've been about this, that, and then he turns to Israel. You aren't any better. So this, this value that they have had impressed upon them, and remember, you see, this isn't coming from their impression. This isn't self-reflection. This isn't philosophical uh, contemplation. Israel sees all of this as divine revelation. It's the word of the Lord who declares this. It's while they see God in events, in activities, they never present this as their understanding of seeing God in this, they present it as God telling them. I'm the one who did this. I'm the one who's going to do this. So when it happens, you won't be surprised that it happens and you'll know who brought it on. And that's particularly a matter of their disappearance, their exiles, the prophets, Declare this as the word of this creator covenant God. These were the values you committed yourself to. You promised me you would carry on and you didn't. And therefore, their consequences are going to come back on you. So now, what do you do? with this.
when the judgment of God comes back on you and it involves immeasurable suffering, what do you do? Do you uh, try to cop out? Do you recognize the judgment as God's righteous judgment? And surrender, give up. Now again, they don't imagine some hope in this. They receive God's revelation that this isn't the end. that the judgment of God is restorative. That in bringing judgment upon the people, even though it takes them to the brink of extinction, they won't become extinct. They won't disappear. That God's purpose will still be accomplished in them. That in this judgment, in this suffering, there will be salvation, restoration, recovery, renewal. Not just for them. But that their suffering can somehow have meaningful value for others. Now, did you catch in the story in the book where he talks about this suffering and it's restorative. What passage of scripture did he quote at length? No, he did quote it. Pardon? He does that, but there's a longer passage that he deals with the suffering and its value, its power, its meaning. Isaiah 53, which we understand as prophetic of the Messiah. And some of them sometimes did. But when you read the passages in Isaiah that talk about this servant of God, there are a couple of them where God makes it pretty clear that the servant he's talking about in that passage is not a person, it's his people. So it's not just that Israel is refined by suffering, cleansed in suffering, um, reformed from its injustice and its idolatry. It's that suffering can actually bring benefit to others. The term that's used in Christian thought is vicarious.
Now, Israel, from our documents that we have, doesn't seem to pick on that in messianism in the Messiah like Christianity did. Uh, but they still see in this rescue, revival, restoration, the work of God being pretty dramatic and extensive. And occasionally pictured, understood, to be implemented by an important figure. And so in the absence of a king, Psalms like Psalm 2, uh, Yahweh has put his anointed one on the throne, is seen as a hope that Israel will be restored, not just to the promised land, not just to a rebuilt temple, but to a real national identity. Not just as a people, an ethnic group, but as an identifiable nation on the world stage. Uh, this takes real roots in Jesus' day, not just by him and his followers, but by preceders. Remember uh, when the apostles were on trial at one time, Gamaliel says, now we don't need, we shouldn't really worry about these guys too much. Remember, we've had a couple of guys before that who made this claim and they're not around anymore. So if this isn't of God, it'll fade like these others. And, and ultimately in, one, in the 130, um, there is a man who is uh, designated as the son of the star, Bar Kokhba, who leads a second revolt against Rome. Uh, and there was a prominent rabbi who supported that, uh, most of the Pharisees didn't, but he did. Um, and there was great, great hope that now we have a Messiah. When that disappears because of his death and the destruction of his people, Orthodox Judaism under the Pharisees in this reform greatly lose this idea of a person and they see God's messianic age as being brought in either by the gradual infusion and development of his values and ideas among the Jewish people and those that they teach, or they see this as some dramatic event in which God will actually intervene himself and do great things, and you get what is often called apocalyptic literature. And there's some of that that arises. There's some of it in the first century before Jesus, and then in that century of Jesus, and the next century, uh, who see God intervening in the world, although there's not a singular character who's the agent of God, but he brings in great destruction against those forces that are perceived as evil and uh, uh, raises up his people. Uh, and again, this is to a certain degree a natural consequence of what they've concluded, i.e., from their vantage point, what they've been taught by God that this endeavor uh, can't end, it has to succeed. 
And so they will be a light to the Gentiles. They will be the source of learning that will ultimately bring the world to share all of these values and restore this creation, the human creation, to the worship of God. Within which then, this whole creation will be restored to its intended character by the creator. Now, how do you take these ideas perpetuate them, refine them, and more importantly, implement them in the lives of people. And Smith develops this in the, the section that he calls the hallowing of life. That in order to uh, sustain these ideals, pass them on from generation to generation, expand their acceptance, uh, constantly purify their accomplishment because we humans will always try to peel off the edges of them. You get this very strong commitment to the rituals of life. You get the tevya of Fiddler on a Roof, commitment to tradition. Um, how you dress. Um, how you act in the home, um, what you do on a daily basis, and so develop this whole series of rituals that in Orthodox Judaism become sacrosanct, are often even maintained in Reformed Judaism communities, families, uh, one of the interesting things that was happening uh, when I delved into their experience by going to Hebrew Union, their, the Reform Seminary here in uh, America uh, a number of years ago, were the number of young people who were coming to, to school to become rabbis in Reform synagogues they came from reform families, but while their families hadn't practiced a lot of these uh, traditions, customs, they were doing them. The uh, keep out of the cap, for instance, um, was not commonly worn in reform Jewish families, men, except when they would go into the synagogue. And in some synagogues, they didn't even do it then. Um, Reformed Jews wear them all the time. Uh, the prayer shawl was not a common thing in a Jewish synagogue, Reformed Jewish synagogue. But uh, I saw it fairly frequently, one or more of the people would wear one in a synagogue service. The synagogues existed in the time of Jesus. We don't know when they started, why they started. Um, one of the professors I had, who's 
whose major emphasis was the second temple period, particularly the Hellenistic period of Judaism, the 300 years before Jesus and the, and the 100 years of Jesus, um, he held the position that they didn't even exist uh, at least 400 years before Jesus and maybe even 300 years before Jesus because there's a book uh, written, it's in the Apocrypha uh, by a man who's, who's writing down his grandfather's work, Ben Sirach, uh, and he uh, talks about Jewish life very extensively, and he never mentions the synagogue. Anyway, it was there. But it becomes absolutely crucial in Orthodox Judaism, and thus is to this day, even in Reform Judaism. Um, the Reform Jewish synagogues even have Sunday school. Uh, because this is the center of their learning. And through the centuries until modern time, when education became more public, the synagogues through the centuries was the Jewish school. Uh, the parents would go on Saturday to Sabbath services. The children, boys, went, and the girls who could pass as boys, or whose fathers let them go, went all week. Uh, and the study of Torah, and of course it was not just the study of the Torah itself, those first five books of the Old Testament, but all the other books that they collected to them, the works of the prophets and the writings, and the oral law that they believed had been given at the same time, which had finally been written down in the Mishnah, and then in the Talmud where you had some commentaries about it, that all was Torah study. And so there was immense illiterature to be learned, not just to be familiar with, not just to, to understand it, but to have great portions of it memorized. Uh, the um, dietary, principles in the Old Testament became codified and elaborated. Uh, the purification rites of the Old Testament were developed. Liturgies were written around them. Uh, and the festivals, the feasts in Old Testament, Old English terminology become important. Uh, they all become issues in the home because they don't have the temple anymore. Uh, and they add to their significance. Uh, when you look at the, the Jewish festivals, you have to remember that there's a calendar change in Israel. In the Old Testament, in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, when they're created, at Mount Sinai, the Passover that takes place while they're there is designated as the beginning of the year. And so in the Old Testament, it's the first of the year. When they go into exile, they end up adopting the Assyrian, the Aramaic, calendar, which starts in the fall. And so, quote, the civil calendar by which they go starts in the fall. And the religious calendar starts with Passover. Uh, so the new year, the head of the year, Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah, uh, takes on not just the new year, but in historic Judaism, 
becomes the celebration of the creation of the world. Atonement Day that follows shortly thereafter becomes a day of great reflection, and repentance, reconciliation, and recommitment. The period of booths that follows shortly thereafter, seven days commemorating their time in the wilderness in which they leave their homes and they live in a tent, a booth, a hut that they create. Um, often now, of course, it's in their yard uh, so they can still have access to the restrooms and all those kinds of things and their kitchens and so forth. Uh, following that, there is the extra biblical, not in the Bible, celebration of that recovery of the temple from the Syrian Greeks under the Hasmoneans. And uh, the temple is rededicated. And the tradition is that when they rededicated the temple, the conditions were so dire that they didn't even have enough oil to put in the lampstand for the set for seven days of celebration. Except that when they started doing it, the oil seemed to keep on coming. And so they have this Hanukkah celebration of lights, that the candelabra is used. Um, the last biblical one, which is not original to the Torah, the uh, celebration of their escape from the, the genocide attempt of Haman under Esther, uh, Purim, and then you're back to the spring where Passover celebrates the Exodus. Uh, four, seven weeks later, um, and Shavuot is simply weeks, um, you have the, a celebration that in the Old Testament was the, supposed to be the time that they bring an offering of the very first fruits of the field, the very first grain. They, uh, it has become um, a celebration of the giving of the law at Sinai. And then you have, I gave you a copy of a modern Jewish holiday thing. Uh, they have a couple of more holidays that they celebrate. One celebrates the, the death of Bar Kokhba. Um, one celebrates the Holocaust. And then, of course, in Israel, you have the ones that celebrate the founding of Israel, their Independence Day, and that kind of thing. And I gave you a couple of minutes for questions. Uh, I didn't mention in the kosher food, the, this involves not only those things that you can eat, but all the combinations thereof, and with respect to meats, uh, they developed a whole series of rules of how you could slaughter the meats. There's brief mentions of a couple of those kinds of things in the Old Testament, but of course, they don't clear up all the loose ends. And so Judaism developed a vast array of rules about all of these things. What you can do on the Sabbath day, what constitutes work, what you can't do on the Sabbath day. Um, since one of the rules that develops in the story of numbers, you can't have a fire. Well, when you, if you live in, in Alaska, how can you stay warm on, on the Sabbath day? Uh, you got to have some way of staying warm. Um, I think I was uh, I'm trying to work back to my Hebrew notes, but I have a really small mark about my Hebrew journey. Is it chapter at all? 
Um, so I know that they believe that he's son of God. Your life is meant to He is in, especially in Reformed Judaism. Uh, because as much as anything, because of the oppression that the Jews experienced through the centuries, Reform Judaism has very little mention of. There's a couple of mentions in the Talmud, for instance, uh, references, um, but their literature pretty effectively ignores him in Maine because uh, very early they have very negative experiences with Christians. Um, and so they, they don't, the less said, the better. Uh, in, uh, in, in Jewish scholarship, uh, there are any number of Jewish scholars uh, who uh, have done a lot of research and writing about uh, Christ and Christianity. Uh, this professor I mentioned a while ago, whose specialty was the Second Temple period from the build, rebuilding of the temple under uh, Ezra and Nehemiah days until the um, early Christian era. Uh, his real super specialty was the Pharisees. He was one of the world renowned experts on the Pharisees, especially the Pharisees of the, of the time of Jesus and through the, through the second and third century of the modern year. Uh, and uh, he relied on the New Testament uh, heavily for information about the Pharisees, uh, even though they're cast in a negative light. Uh, he sees that negative light as descriptive of the Pharisees of that day, that uh, um, there, that Jesus and the and, and his followers' perception of them um, has to be taken into consideration, uh, and he was he, he was um, perfectly happy with the historicity, the accuracy of the gospels and the book of Acts with reference to the nature, the character, the ideas, the ideals, the attitudes, behavior of the Pharisees. Um, he obviously knew all of the, the relevant um, Jewish literature too. Uh, and uh, while I was there, they hired a professor um, uh, as a complement to that area. And he had a PhD uh, in Christianity uh, because he believed that the New Testament uh, is a, is a irreplaceable document for understanding the experience of Judaism of the first century. Uh, and uh, you know, are quick to remind you, Jesus was a Jew. <laughs> and what you read about Jesus in the New Testament is reflective of his Judaism. Uh, and that his ideas we're not foreign to Judaism. Um, they, they latch hold of very strongly the New Testament's use of Old Testament passages in the teaching of Jesus. Uh, you know, this isn't foreign. Uh, this, is, this is standard straight Judaism. Uh, Yeah, he was a he was a great teacher. He was a good rabbi, uh, 
And unfortunately, because of uh, a, a number of factors, um, and of course it depends on who you follow, there are some, for instance, who, who believe that Jesus' death is precipitated by him, that he creates the negative environment uh, to get himself crucified um, in the mistaken view that in the uh, attempt to take his life, um, there will be a great rebellion to, to rescue him. Uh, the, the view that he may have even understood Isaiah 53 in a vicarious way and believed that in his death he could bring about revival in Judaism. Um, and he did. You know, uh, Judaism is immeasurably revived in those early Christians and uh, there are uh, many among them who, uh, who, who believe that the passage, that the, the section that um, uh, Smith had about the mind of the church, the creation of the doctrine of the atonement, uh, the incarnation and the Trinity are all way post Jesus developments. Um, and if you go back to the Jesus of the New Testament, uh, you would have a perfectly acceptable Jewish rabbi. Uh, unfortunately, that's difficult to accomplish nowadays, given the terrible, terrible wrath of Christianity upon Judaism for 2000 since then. Uh, But no, they don't deal with him or the New Testament to any significant degree because they see that as captured by this Christendom under whom they have suffered immeasurably. So they're not happy with um conversion to Christianity. And many of them are not at all happy with Messianic Judaism. Uh, Messianic Judaism uh, sustains much of the Old Testament, festival, uh, practice, tradition. Uh, but of course, de declares Jesus as Messiah. Uh, and modern Jews aren't very comfortable with that declaration. And of course, many Reformed Jews, even if they converted, even if they came to faith in Jesus, would not be particularly attracted to Messianic Judaism because Messianic Judaism sustains a great deal of the festival and the, the Jewish music and a lot of this kind of thing, which a, a modern, a modern, especially American European Jew, would not find any uh, significance with either because that's he's never or she's never that's not been a part of their Judaism their Judaism was mainly ethnic and cultural not religious yeah 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 and much of the Judaism you will see in America is Reformed Judaism. Now, the cities like, like this area, you will have conservative Jewish synagogues and even Orthodox, even ultra-Orthodox Jewish synagogues here. But the, the significant majority of Jews that you would meet in America, um, except maybe recent immigrants, 
will be Reformed Jews. And Reformed Judaism uh, jettisoned a great deal of the customs, the traditions, the practices, because they saw them as simply outward shells and not necessary. You could believe in the righteousness of God, the importance of the righteousness of God, all of the ideal values of Judaism, but you didn't need to keep a kosher kitchen. You know, that, that doesn't have any direct connection to the righteousness of God, to the mercy of God, to the creatorship of God, uh, to the Ten Commandments and the moral values that are there. Uh, so that even as Christianity, you see, jettisoned the vast majority of those practices and traditions and didn't deviate, didn't go off into idolatry. Um, if you don't press the Trinity too hard, don't go off into uh, other gods and are, are still monotheists. Uh, and, and so they, they saw the ability to have a Judaism like the Christianity. And of course, Reformed Judaism emerges in the early days of the Enlightenment where many Christians were doing the same thing. They didn't think you had to do a lot of the Christian stuff like not eat meat on Friday or whatever the customs of the church were in the country that you were in. That uh, there weren't certain limitations or requirements on dress. That had nothing to do with your spirituality. Uh, Jesus had certainly talked about the fact that it's not what goes into the mouth that corrupts a man, it's what goes into the heart. Uh, and so there were Christians who were becoming less and less traditionalists. And Reformed Judaism comes out of that same spirit. Okay, any other questions? We're ready to uh, then next week go to the uh, next closest related religion. And that's Islam, both because it arises in the same part of the world and because it arises with a certain uh, historical element of its origin. It, it does not develop the uh, emphatic centrality of, of a history um, like Judaism and Christianity do, but it still has a major connection to history. And so we'll go to it before we go off into the East. Okay, y'all have a good week. I've included a reflection sheet for you if you wanna use it. Y'all be blessed. As much as possible. And uh, does he have a pretty significant section about history at the beginning? We'll do Islam a lot like we did. Yeah, we'll do we'll do Islam a lot like we did Judaism in terms of history. Uh, we'll, we'll only get to those in terms of the, the couple that are important in terms of its origin. Because it, theological, 
concepts. So when he starts that, um, is there a section at the end where he does like Judaism and he does customs practices? Um, it might be there. Uh, the five pillars are the basic part. Of, no, I'm thinking in terms of uh, tradition, practices, daily life elements. The five pillars are their their central practice ideals. Uh, that, that last little bit about withered uh, Islam would probably tack on to the last of its history. Because next week we'll look mainly at history uh, and we'll touch on themes like the emergence of the Quran and the, the five pillar practices, that kind of thing. But we won't focus on those. We'll, we'll be mainly looking at the history how do you get to the Sunni uh, Shia controversy of today? That kind of thing. So five pillars is too far or far? Uh, that's far enough. If you get that far, you'll have most of it. Uh, so after pillars, you said something, I just want to confirm. So could we say that it's only two groups of the no, and if Messianic Judaism wouldn't consider themselves, wouldn't be considered Jews by Judaism. They wouldn't be encompassed in Judaism. I think they should be as a legitimate uh, sect of the Jews. Uh, and they consider themselves that way. Uh, the other Jews look at them as Christians and therefore they're not Jews. Yeah. Precisely, and 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 they particularly get heated over it because the citizenship rules of Israel are you can't be a Christian. You can be an atheistic Jew, born of Jewish parents, have a Jewish ethnic lineage that you can demonstrate. And you can become a citizen of Israel. It doesn't make any difference how pure your lineage is. If you, if you believe in the Messiah, Jesus, you can't be a citizen of Israel. You'd have to say that. You have to tell them that that's, that's part of their inquiry process. They don't boot them out. You can live there, but you can't be a voting citizen. And there are a lot of there are a lot of Christians who who live in Israel. There are a significant number, not huge number, but there are a significant number of Jews, of Christians, who believe that the end times involve Israel. They hold the view that before, that in the early time, early development of the end times, the church is raptured out. All the living Christians are taken out of this world. We're not even here. Jesus comes back and sets up a world kingdom in Jerusalem. And the temple is rebuilt. The Jewish people, to a great extent, massive extent, are converted to believe in the Messiah. And a thousand year millennial kingdom on this earth, full political, economic, social reality exists. Uh, and therefore, there are Christians who have gone back to Israel, gone to Israel to live. And there are a lot of them 
who, uh, and, and there's a huge amount of Christians and their money who support the restoration of the nation of Israel because they believe that's the beginning of the Messianic kingdom. And that pretty shortly now, Jesus is going to have to come back especially if things get much more precarious than they are right now. Yeah, the Christians, but they want to be there. Yeah, they want to be raptured from Israel. They want to be, because they want to be there when Jesus comes back. They want to see him when he comes back. To, I understand. No, no. And th then there are those who believe that he's going to come back and he's going to set this kingdom up, they don't happen to hold to the rapture view. And so they want to be there to be a part of that kingdom. That what? Oh, no, all of us are going to be. No, all the Christians are going to be. They want to be there because that's where he's going to come back to. Um, and, and there are all kinds of various views as to how this exactly happens in what order and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Do they find like, you don't think it's compromised into their salvation? No, no. Uh, and of course, you see, from their standpoint, we're the ones who compromised uh, because we don't accept we don't accept what the Bible tells us about the way things are going to happen, right. and therefore we're going to be there. Uh, the, the rapture of the church is, re, it, it is there, I still think, for some very interesting reasons but that I still don't understand. Because the fact that the end times are going to be about Israel, I don't see why that has to have any implication about whether the Christians are here or not. Why Israel, to a great degree by great miraculous signs that God produces are converted to believe in the Messiah has to in any way at all remove the church. Now one of the major uh, reasons for the rapture of the church in some of this theology is that in this conversion of the Jews either before it, during it, or after it, uh, and this coming of Jesus to begin his kingdom, there's going to be this horrible, horrible time of distress. Uh, the, uh, now the word is escaping. Uh, the tribulation, the great tribulation. And, and God's going to save his people from that tribulation because he's going to take us out. Uh, I still don't understand why that's necessary either, but that's part of the view and that we won't have to suffer at least all of the tribulation. And there's a question about whether he, the rapture is going to come at the beginning of the tribulation or, and, you know, or in the middle of it or at the end of it. Um, Hopefully, for those of, for those of us with the greatest hope, it'll be at the beginning. See, uh, but the 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 major point is that those end times, real end times, aren't about the church and Christians at all. They're about God fulfilling all these promises that are in the Old Testament about the Messiah being a global ruler uh, with, uh, uh, from God's people. And those weren't fulfilled. Clearly, Jesus wasn't crowned. He was crucified. Uh, and so for these, these promises to be accomplished, they're going to have to happen 
at the end. And it's going to be about the Jews. Uh, uh, so what you have in Judaism is this, usually it's called three prong. You have the Orthodox Jew. You have the Reformed Jew. And then there's a middle group that's semi-reformed, <laughs> semi-Orthodox. They call themselves the conservative Jews. Now, what you also have within those three are several splinter groups. Uh, you have the, the, the very commonly seen, the, the Hasidim Jews. Uh, they're, they started out being Reformed Jews. But unlike the Reformed Jews, they only reformed to the culture of their day, and then they froze. It. So they're the Amish of Judaism. Yeah, they're, they're theologically, they started out as reform, the Hasidim, uh, but they froze culturally in the 18th, 17th, 18th century where they arose. So they still dress, they still won't use modern appliances, all that kind of stuff. Um, you have a group that arose prior to that. Uh, I, I want to say the ninth century uh, in Mesopotamia, there were a group of Jews who uh, rejected the oral law and thus the basis for all of Orthodox Judaism. And they became proponents of Torah only. And so significantly liberated themselves from a great deal of the very things the Reformed Jews were trying to liberate themselves from, a lot of these customs, practices that only arose in Pharisee Reform, in, in Pharisee Orthodox Judaism. They aren't there in the Old Testament. Uh, a lot of the specifications about the Sabbath day and the butchering of animals and the preparation of the kosher foods and uh, issues of dress and all that kind of stuff. Uh, that's all rabbinic Judaism. And they rejected it because the rabbinic Jews built that out of the or belief that it was a part of the oral law that God had given. Um, and so you have this group of Jews. Um, then you have the, the separation, significant variations ethnically. So the reformed Jew or the Orthodox Jew of Russia or Poland would not be anything like the reformed Jew or the Orthodox Jew who came out of the Middle East uh, were descendants of those uh, Jews of, of uh, Spain. Well, they were deported, they were driven out of Spain 500 years ago, but they retained a very significant um, tradition about a lot of this stuff. Uh, and then you have this group of Jews that uh, grew up in uh, Ethiopia. Uh, and so you have not only the ethnicity, you have a whole racial stock difference. Uh, and even though a great number of those people at one time were uh, rescued, quote, from Ethiopia and brought to, to Israel, there's, uh, there are distinctive enough that um, hardline conservative Jews, not very sure they're really Jews. Uh, so there's a, there's a tremendous diversity. In, in Judaism. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
And then you see, you have since World War II, you've got what now, two, three generations of Jews who are ethnically Jews, but their families became almost aggressive atheists over the Holocaust. They're, 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 this, this idea that there's a creator God who called us out as his people, uh, that can't possibly be true. No, no, the God of the Bible couldn't possibly tolerated the Holocaust. He would have had to have intervened in some way far sooner, far more aggressively than. And since he didn't, either he couldn't or he didn't want to. In either case, who wants a God like that? And so you have large, large segment of European and American Jews who are openly, avowedly, unapologetically atheists. And those are the ones that live in, in Israel. Would you say that they're, it's just like- It's the same thing. Total, absolute mix. Yeah. Orthodox Judaism controls Israel. Um, very, very significantly um, to the chagrin. Reform Jews have only been in the last, I don't know, 10 years or so, been able to build synagogues in, in Israel because the reform, the Orthodox Jews would not accept them. Uh, they, had, they built a seminary there, but they couldn't own the property because Orthodox Judaism has such a such control. Uh, Hebrew reform. Yeah, Hebrew unions reform. But Hebrew is union is the is the the seminary of Reform Judaism. The man who brought Reform Judaism to this country started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, or from their standpoint, don't accept it. <laughs> you see, there's a there's a difference in their view. You know, uh, and in,
No, it's still there. What is that? Mean? I have no idea. <laughs> 